Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, you've heard me talk about newspapers.com as being such a game changer for researchers. The depth and breadth of information about Civil War soldiers and sailors before, during, and after the conflict is nothing short of astounding. So much great primary source material, so much of it hasn't been seen in decades. I read many passages from newspapers.com stories on these videos, and I want to read another one today. It was shared with me by Military Images senior editor Phil Spoggy. Phil is a passionate researcher who is now writing a column for us called Of Arms and Men. The tagline is at the intersection of photography and ordnance technology. Look for it in our next issue. That's the summer issue. Phil was alerted to the story, the article I'm going to read to you, by another Phil. His name is Phil Harris, and he's a historian of the 19th Indiana Infantry who has gone, so I am told, to extraordinary lengths to obtain markers for soldiers in the regiment. He's definitely a kindred spirit. I hope to meet him in person someday. Phil, I know you're a listener, and thanks for your support. The article Phil discovered appeared in the January 23rd, 1889 issue of the Indiana State Sentinel. The headline is, quote, vets and their old flags, end quote. Then there's a long subheadline, quote, some scenes in the state library, gray bearded men weeping over their regimental colors and overpowering desire to get a fragment as a relic, vandalism, end quote. A reporter interviewed the state librarian about what might be termed the eccentricities or peculiarities of old soldiers and their attachment to the many battle flags stored inside the building. The librarian shared several stories that reveal that special, unique bond between a soldier and the flag they followed throughout the Civil War. There's one particular passage that describes what happens to soldiers when they go into battle for the first time and how it stays with them. When I first read the passage, it reminded me of the root of what we know today as post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, without further ado, the full version of Vets and Their Old Flags. Here we go. Quote, Mrs. Lizzie Callis Scott, during her three terms as state librarian, has had frequent occasion to become quite well acquainted with what might be termed the eccentricities or peculiarities of old soldiers. In her charge, the state had placed the flags of the various regiments enlisted from Indiana during the great civil conflict. To care for these banners would seem, at first sight, to impose only nominal duties, but Mrs. Scott's experience has taught her otherwise. Not a few times has her regard for her duties as custodian come into conflict with the personal likes or dislikes of some old veteran. The love of a soldier for his flag is proverbial. To most people, there is more in the national ensign than the material out of which it is made. To him who has followed it on the march or through the smoke of battle, it becomes at once the embodiment of the principles of our government and is looked upon as something sacred or divine. Around it clusters all the associations of camp life and hard-fought field. This, the discomfiture of defeat, the elation of victory, the sufferings at Andersonville, the parole and homeward return. After an engagement, a soldier is a changed man from the time when kept in suspense in the rear, expecting each moment to be ordered to the front where musketry rattles and artillery thunders to the time when nightfall puts an end to the struggle, 
the soldier lives months and minutes. His past life seems thereafter an ill-remembered dream. Nothing is before him. Nothing is vividly present but the scenes of the conflict. That picture never fades, but is terribly real through life. No wonder, then, that the veteran should have differences of opinion with the state librarian regarding the disposal or custody of his, always his, flag. Two years ago, epistolary demands poured in upon Mrs. Scott for the use of flags at reunions. She promptly answered that she could not thus send the state's property out of her custody. The petitioners remonstrated. She explained. Almost invariably, in response to her answer, came another demand with the declaration, almost pitiful, that a reunion would not seem like a reunion unless the old flag was present. Mrs. Scott, however, remained firm, and soon remonstrances were heard on every hand. Mrs. Scott laid the matter before the governor, saying that, with his consent, she might see a way toward loaning the flags, but, at the same time she wanted it understood, she would disclaim all responsibility for their preservation or return. The decided stand she took availed much, and since that time, demands for the flags have been considerably less. Individual requests to be shown the colors are numerous. The conduct of an old soldier on such occasions cannot be appreciated by an ordinary observer. At one time, said Mrs. Scott, a veteran of 60 years came into my office and said, in a conciliatory tone, I like you very much. I said I was glad of that, that I liked to have everybody have a good opinion of me. There is one thing I have against you, he said. What is that, I asked. You won't let us have our flags. Mrs. Scott explained that she could not let them go out of the office. Should she do it, it would not be long before there would be no flags. Some of them, she added, are in tatters and would barely hold together. I know that, replied the old volunteer, but it does us good just to look at the pole. At another time, a portly, grizzled old man entered the state library and requested to be allowed a sight of the colors of his regiment. He was accommodated. He stood as if transfixed for fully a minute when shown the tattered stars and stripes. Then, with a downward sweep of the hand, he exclaimed while the tears coursed down his cheeks, I love that flag better than I love my wife. Mrs. Scott has frequently had occasion to repress an inclination on the part of visiting soldiers to cut or tear away a piece of their flags. It is seldom that such visitors call without requesting the permission before they leave of taking a piece or even a mere shred of their regimental colors. Some of the soldier callers have even offered Mrs. Scott bribes for such permission, though they did not seem to look at the matter in the light of bribery. At one time, an old soldier offered to give a $20 gold piece for an inch square of flag. Another offered 20 acres of good land. If I had been of a business turn of mind, said Mrs. Scott humorously, I might have owned a farm or two. There was one old veteran whom Mrs. Scott had occasion to remember. After being shown his flag, he deliberately tore off a piece. That I cannot allow, said Mrs. Scott. You will have to leave the office. As he went away, he said, you do not know how much good it will do me to take this piece home and show it to my wife and children. But a few months ago, a party of Indiana soldiers from Kansas visited the library. Before they left, one of them deliberately stole the cord and tassel from his flag. The fact, however, did not become known until he had left the city. The flags are sometimes such a care 
naturally concluded Mrs. Scott after a recital of these experiences. So there you have the story of the Indiana regimental flags at the state library and an interview with the state librarian about some of the soldiers who came through the old soldiers to get one more glimpse at their flag. Also, remember that description about once a soldier goes into battle, their life is changed forever, and that flag becomes the embodiment of that experience, one that they hold with them through the rest of their lives. Take care. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.